here. It's such a beautiful place, and uh, also uh, Pauline Van der Duish has been my colleague for a long time, and so it's always good to renew that association. So I also want to acknowledge thanks to, I won't go through this, but to the various uh, funding agencies that have supported my work. Um, so Charles Darwin was obviously a great naturalist, but he was arguably also the first great ecologist. And that partnership between natural history uh, and ecology uh, is much broader. Natural history was the cradle of ecology, and it remains the foundation. But early on, it became clear that understanding ecological patterns meant you had to understand dynamics. And that meant that ecology had to evolve, and in particular, had to build partnerships with mathematics. And then it continues to evolve, adding partnerships <coughs> with physics, with chemistry, with engineering, um, and with genomics. And to some extent, but to a lesser extent, with the social sciences and the humanities. So my story is going to be an argument uh, that we have to address that, that that last circle is too small. I'm going to split my lecture into three parts. So first of all, I'll say a little bit about classical advances, going back, for example, to the work of Lotko and Volterra, that will be well known to many of you. Secondly, the computation revolution, which has changed ecology. Um, it changed mathematical ecology. Indeed, mathematics and computation are speeding in advances not just in ecology, but obviously across biology. The genomics and protein structure of any, anybody who's been associated with the university for more than 10 years, any university has seen dramatic changes there. Uh, in evolutionary theory and epidemiology, uh, and in immunology, and of course, uh, in ecology. So that will be the second part of the lecture. And then the third part will be, what are the prospects for the future? And that will be largely increasing the connection with the social sciences and the humanities. I want to make an argument to you that that's really an exciting new area for um, theoretical ecology. We'll try to argue for the importance of that area. That's not to argue that the other areas are done or finished, uh, but this has to be added to the list. So in ecology, mathematical approaches have had a very long history, and a lot of good work's been done here and other places. Um, in basic theory, in particular, uh, in demography, in life history theory, and evolution, and behavioral ecology, and in the interactions uh, among species and the development of ecological communities and ecosystems. But there's also been um, a rich literature in the applications of theoretical ecology to infectious diseases, to harvesting theory of fisheries. And Vancouver, Victoria, this whole area has been a nexus for a lot of brilliant work on salmon management, etc. To the design, to conservation and reserve design, to bioeconomics, uh, and its relationship to social systems, and to climate change. The history of mathematical ecology actually goes back quite a long way. It goes back in the 17th century and, and maybe even before to people like John Grout, who were great demographers who developed the first mathematical model of population growth. Mathematical evolutionary theory is not as old as that, but it certainly goes back to the beginning of the last century when Fisher and Haldane and Wright were developing the mathematical foundations of population genetics and evolutionary theory. And the dynamics of interacting species, the work of, that I mentioned earlier of Volterra, the great mathematician uh, in Italy, and Alfred Lotka, who was an actuary and a chemist, who developed the, the models that are still used today as the basis for much work. Um, of course, models of the dynamics of infectious diseases have played a fundamental role in their management, especially the development of vaccination strategies. And there have been similar successes that have characterized resource management, especially fisheries and reserve the design. And today, the new challenge that faces us, where a lot of work has taken place, is climate change research, which relies heavily on modeling approaches. So, these sorts of problems highlight what, for me, are three great grand challenges in environmental science. The 
systems approach to this. First of all, what makes ecological systems robust and resilient and prevents critical transitions? For example, is climate change destabilizing ecosystems? Secondly, how do the patterns that we see in this system, and I don't mean just the spatial patterns, as you'll see, I mean patterns of nutrient cycling and the like, how does that emerge from the processes where evolution is most effective at, at the levels of individuals and individual populations? How is it from that that we see the emergence of patterns, and how do we scale from the microscopic to the macroscopic? In terms of climate change, that means things like how do we predict rain shifts and extinction in a changing environment. And the last big challenge is to recognize that if you have processes that are going on on multiple scales, involving individuals and other units at higher scales, there are going to be conflicts between what's good for the individuals and what's good uh, for the broader community. And how do those issues get resolved? And there are lots of examples even within our own bodies uh, in terms of conflict, for example, tumor cells represent a breakdown of, of the conflict. So I will deal with uh, all of those problems, but in terms of climate change, in particular, I'm going to deal with things like how, what strategies are available for managing the local commons. Um, are there insurance arrangements that can, can be instituted? What's the mathematics of that? And how do, what, how do we approach international agreements, not only on climate change, but on other environmental problems? So there may be sound coming in here in a minute uh, that, that I can't control. But uh, ecosystems and the biosphere are complex adaptive systems, like this flock of starlings, or at least the N minus one of them are starlings. You, you will see a hawk here, which is driving a lot of these patterns. Complex adaptive systems are systems that are made up of individual agents, heterogeneous collections of individuals that interact locally and evolve. When I say evolve, I don't mean necessarily genetically. I mean uh, they, they change their behaviors, possibly genetically. Uh, that leads to emergent patterns at the broader scales which feed back to affect individual behaviors. Yeah, I can't connect to it. So here is. When I first saw, when I first observed flocks of birds, or saw movies of this sort, having been trained in fluid dynamics, um, it was too tempting to ignore that one ought to be able to understand these macroscopic patterns to ask whether they have some uh, adaptive significance and how do those patterns emerge, how do they feed back to influence individual behavior. Not only ecosystems, but also the socioeconomic systems with which they're interconnected are complex adaptive systems. In 2008, six months before the stock markets collapsed in the United States, you probably didn't hear about that here. <laughs> <laughs> Actually, the Canadian system was much more buffered. The banking system was much better than in, uh, in the US. Um, Bob May and George Sugahara and I wrote a paper uh, in nature, which said, we're just humble ecologists. But if we look at the interconnectedness of the banking system and compare it to the interconnectedness um, of ecological systems, we would be worried if we were, had anything to do with the management of the banking systems. Because when ecological systems that get that interconnected, they are prone to collapse. We wrote, who knows, for instance, how the present concern over subprime loans will pan out? <laughs> well, I wish I had read this paper and not just written it. Because <laughs> I thought it was just theory. And we wrote this paper, and six months later, the markets collapsed, and we didn't get into trouble. It wasn't that we had caused them to collapse. Uh, but it suggested that systems of this sort that are too interconnected are subject to collapse. In fact, transitions of this sort are widespread. I'll refer to this book later, but Mark Skeffer wrote a book in a series I happen to edit called Critical Nature Transitions in Nature and Society, which said lots of systems are prone to collapse. And maybe it would be good if we could detect early warning indicators. For example, 
every year when I go to the doctor, I get an uh, EKG, uh, an electrocardiogram, um, which is meant to, to not to, to tell the doctor if I'm already in trouble, but if there are some indicators in my heart rate that, uh, uh, <coughs> that might signify that I was a candidate for collapse. Electroencephalograms also can be indicators that there, uh, there are problems uh, that uh, anything from migraines to seizures that may be coming about. There are also likely tipping points in the climate systems as well as in fisheries and other species and maybe even in our societies. Um, so in the audience tonight is uh, my collaborator and former student, Carla Staver. When Carla was a student, she and Sally Archibald, a South African student who visited with us, and I began working on savanna and forest systems. And what this map shows you is areas that um, are dominated by savannas, areas that are dominated by forests, and areas we call, they call, if I say I, I mean we. If I say we, I mean Carla and Sally did. Uh, uh, by stable. And this goes back to the work of a colleague of mine at Cornell, uh, Robert H. Whitaker, who modified something called the Holdridge diagram to lay out what sorts of, what sorts of vegetation what ought to expect in different areas. This is the average temperature. This is the average precipitation. And based on that, you ought to be able to predict where tropical rainforests are, where tundra is, etc. And this works pretty well, but there's some uncertainty that is associated with it. A lot of the ecological pattern is exogenous, it tracks the environmental pattern. But coming back to uh, the map I showed you before, there are these regions we call bistable, which meant they could exist in one of, of, of at least two alternative stable states. And our argument was that what determined the transition between them, what determined which species would be where, which types of species would be where, was fire. The idea was that grass burns easily, doesn't kill the grass, but it prevents the trees from advancing to, um, to the adult state. But once the trees escape in size, they establish an alternative stable state. Um, this was supported by looking at different areas and the percentage of tree cover as a function of whether fire was present or not. Um, and in additional work, we, with a postdoc, Emmanuel Scherzer, we actually modeled the spread of fire um, and got a relationship of this sort. This was just a percolation model on a landscape. Sites either had fire or didn't fire. But, um, <clears throat> if, if the site was burning, it could infect the nearby. Sites. And the, the <coughs> what we wanted to look at was the percentage of burnt area in relationship to the amount of grass. If the amount of grass was small, there was nothing to burn, uh, and therefore the burn area is small. If the amount of grass was high, then the, the frequency of fire was very high. But the striking theory here was the percolation type threshold that gave you a dramatic transition. So we plug this into a model. This is a paper that Carl and I published um, in, in the American Naturalist. And we said the landscape, the sites on the landscape can be one, in one of three states. They can either be dominated, there won't be a lot of equations today, by the way, don't worry. Uh, they can either be dominated by grass, by saplings, or savanna trees. Um, there's no bare space. So this is a very simple model that transitions among these three states. Uh, if um, when the saplings die and they die at a rate mu and they become converted into grass, when the dull trees die at a rate new, they become converted into grass. Um, grass becomes converted into saplings at a rate that's proportional to the probability that a tree will send propagules and colonize that site. But the key term here is this one here, which is the rate at which saplings. Uh, at, advance to the adult stage, and it's a function of the probability of fire, um, which was this function that I showed you before. So we analyzed this. I won't show you the mathematics of this. And the key thing here was that 
you get a diagram of this sort um, in which the precipitation levels at, on the lower axis, grass cover on the upper axis, if precipitation is low, then fire is frequent and grass, this system is dominated by grass. If precipitation is high, then fire is unusual and the grass, uh, I'm sorry, um, the fire is unusual and the grass cover is very low, the system is dominated by trees. But interestingly, and this comes out of mathematics, in this middle region, the system is bi-stable. Uh, there are two stable states, one dominated by grass, the other dominated by trees. And then there's a, a threshold in between. So if you can ever get above it, um, the system will flip into the alternative state. Now, in a paper we just published, in fact, I haven't changed the slide yet, it still shows us is in press, but it's appeared now. Uh, we went back to, and, and to look with uh, uh, Chao Chu Li and Wei Na Yi looked at the, uh, at, at the spatial version of the model, because you remember when you looked at that map originally, it wasn't arbitrary where uh, the bi-stable regions were, and that's what we're trying to account for now. Now transitions of this sort extend beyond the savannah forest uh, biome. Um, going back to Martin Stepper's book where I actually took this diagram. For savannas and forests, the responses to uh, changes in rainfall status will be rapid. And so maybe this will tell us something about what, what climate change is going to do. Uh, the changes, there's, there are hysteretic effects. So the changes are not going to be easy to reverse. But similar phenomena have been observed for a lot of other systems shallow lake systems, where the system can flip from an oligotrophic to a eutrophic lake, pest populations like Buzz Holly's work in Vancouver that can go into outbreak, maybe the general circulation patterns of the ocean, that's a great concern, and as I'm going to come back um, at the end to talk about, the possibility that social norms, attitudes towards climate change, can shift suddenly. So the natural question that Mark Skeffer asked, and as many others have asked, is are there early warning indicators? Are there tea leaves uh, that we can read? And Skeffer is, was impressed by the fact that many transitions of this sort uh, show early warning signs. If you look at this cartoon, the idea of the cartoon is there's a ball that's sitting in an equilibrium at the bottom of the landscape. If you push it away, it comes back. The steeper the sides, the faster it comes back. But suppose this, that the shape of this landscape is changing over time uh, <coughs> due to some slow variable change, the rate at which the system returns to equilibrium is going to be less. That's what's called critical slowing down. So the suggestion was that critical slowing down, the rate at which systems return to their equilibrium, is an indicator that the system maybe is primed for a, uh, uh, a change. Think about our climate systems. Now, uh, related to that is the idea that there'll be increasing variance and increasing autocorrelation. The system gets pushed away. Uh, we get, you, you hear a lot of complaints about the fact that this is global warming. Why is it that we're getting a lot of very cold days as well? Well, it's because the variance in the system is getting greater. And the longer and the system stays away from the equilibrium for much longer periods of time. And if there are alternative states, then the system may start flickering between states. So this is very tempting. Uh, and uh, Martin has written a number of papers on this, uh, at least two of which I'm an author. Uh, and I think this is a very promising area, but I think also one has to be very careful. Because it's only a certain subclass of critical transitions that will show the, the second order transitions that will show these early warning indicators. Imagine a ball moving along a table which is eventually going to fall off a first order transition, it's not going to give us any early warning indicators. So I, I suggested caution here. It reminds me 50 years ago when I first got interested in theoretical biology. Uh, one of the first papers I read was a paper by Rennie Tom, uh, the great uh, topologist, who tried to identify the ways in which systems could transition. What he did for the mathematicians is he wrote a system, of, a dynamical system in which the right-hand side of the equations was the gradient of a potential. 
And then he assumed that that potential function was a polynomial of low degree and classified the kinds of what he called early uh, elementary catastrophes that could occur. And this excited a lot of people. Uh, and the subject got oversold. But the problem is, if A implies B, that doesn't mean when you see B, it was A that caused it. And so people started seeing things that looked like the early, the elementary catastrophes, uh, and said everything was of that sort. So that basically destroyed the subject, destroyed interest in the subject. Uh, one has to understand mechanisms. One has to get the mechanisms right. When I was a little kid, I wondered, how was it that the light on my refrigerator would go on when the door opened. My mother said, there's a little man inside. <laughs> and it turns it off, so you know, you look, but it doesn't work because the little man doesn't come out until the door's shut. Um, so the alternative to that is to learn to build models that allow you to scale from the microscopic to the macroscopic. So that's the second part of the lecture, and that's where I've spent a lot of the last 20 years, is developing models that allow me to understand the dynamics of bird flocks in terms of the behavior of individual birds, uh, et cetera, but more generally to derive uh, macroscopic descriptions from detailed microscopic models. There are three dimensions of that I'm going to talk about. One is the emergence of pattern that Pauline and I have, have a colleague, Jim Murray, Mark Lewis, who's here, was a student of Jim, who had made his career to large part, to large part understanding the, the dynamics of pattern. For example, these simple patterns on, on the coats of giraffes. So how does pattern emerge, including not just spatial pattern, but uh, nutrient cycling and things of that sort? Um, what about rain shifts? Can we predict rain shifts? Are we seeing rain shifts? This is from work uh, led by my former postdoc, uh, Mel Lipinski, now a professor at Rutgers. Uh, we see rain shifts, as I already mentioned, potentially in vegetation. Uh, certainly, there's a lot of concern about rain shifts in pest species. Uh, as mosquitoes populations move uh, further north in the northern hemisphere, will they be carrying disease with them? Uh, and Malin's work, which is largely on fish species and how they're reacting to climate change and the fisheries that go along with them. Uh, and, the, and the third dimension of this is the loss of biodiversity. Um, we're losing biodiversity at unprecedented rates. This showing from 1970 just up to 2000, the biodiversity of terrestrial species, marine, all, all Taxa are showing a decline. Um, it, it, my colleague, um, Marty Blazer, has even argued that there's a dramatic decline in our own microbiota for different reasons. There are a number of causes for biodiversity loss. A lot of them have to do with habitat loss, climate change, pollution, etc. I, I had the good fortune to, to lecture at the UN um, last year, I think, where there was a lot of interest in how much progress we're making in terms of uh, sustainable diversity goal 15, life on land. So a lot of concern, obviously, not just with climate change, but on biodiversity loss. If we want to understand the macroscopic patterns, if we want to understand what makes ecosystems sustainable, we have to focus on the macroscopic features, it's having a discussion about the philosophy of science in terms of what's the right level of detail for models, if you either for prediction or understanding or management. Uh, and we can take a lesson from, from physics, where statistical mechanics and thermodynamics develop to understand what happens if you, if you heat water, if you put a, a gas under pressure, et cetera. There will be critical transitions. We know that they are dependent on all of these molecules and how they move around. But nobody would, it, making a, uh, a cup of tea, would, would worry about building models about what every molecule is doing. We're depending on the statistical mechanics of large ensembles of that. And if we're going to make predictive models of ecological systems, we also have to rely upon the fact that they're emerging, predictable, statistical patterns at the macroscopic levels that, that depend upon the individual molecules, but not all of the details. So what's the right level of detail to ignore? So models of this, of, of the sort I'm talking about have been developed for a variety of systems. My 
colleague at, at Princeton, um, Steve Piccolo, is one of several who have developed forest growth models in which individual trees are grown, allowed to shade each other, disperse seeds, etc. Uh, and from that, one can make predictive models of the dynamics of forests. Those predictive models don't tell you where every tree is going to be. They tell you something about the expected abundance over fairly broad areas of different tree species. And if you extend this out to global levels, going back to the Whitaker diagram, you don't even expect to be able to determine the densities of particular tree species, but rather the ecotypes uh, of classes of species that have uh, similar characteristics. The same sort of dynamics has been carried out for marine systems by Mick Follows and Penny Chisholm and their collaborators. I won't take you through these equations, but these are a, a set of equations of nutrients of different species, phytoplankton and zooplankton, including the spatial dimensions, that they have used in order to predict the distribution of species in the oceans. And again, those have been very successful in predicting where you'll see particular ecotypes, not individual species, but where the large eukaryotes should dominate, where diatoms will dominate, etc. So one always has to understand what is predictable as about the system and what level of detail to expect. Models of this sort have been used not just for vegetation and for the oceans, but for animal flocks, like the bird species I showed you before. Those are not the bird species, these are birds, but the fish schools. With just seconds to go. Um, sorry about that. I think I'll have to put up with that sound for a minute. It's, it's not as exciting as uh, and, and the BBC makes it here. The bird flocks, and what you see at the bottom here, which is a reindeer bird, in which individuals are following other individuals. You can see these are going this way, these are going this way. Uh, these guys are going the wrong way because they're, they're just following each other, but they're just reindeer, and they have nothing else really to do. Anyway. Um, <laughs> and similarly, approaches of this sort are being applied to human populations, uh, and not just how they move, but how they make uh, decisions, the collective <coughs> dynamics of human populations. Which takes me to the last part of the lecture. I've talked about the classical triumphs of theoretical ecology, about what the ability to do detailed modeling has done, and now what are the prospects of, for the future? And there I'm going to argue that we really need to ramp up the interface with the social sciences and the humanities. How do we manage the commons? What are the sorts of insurance arrangements and international agreements that are possible? So scientific consensus is strong on many core ecological and environmental issues. I imagine I don't have to convince people in the audience here that the climate um, is changing, that temperatures are increasing. Uh, but nonetheless, we haven't done anything or not enough about it. And it's not because we don't understand the science. The primary limitations to the solutions are not scientific knowledge, but rather the willingness of people and governments to commit to the common good, and even to accept that change is happening. Um, and to find ways to cooperate and find solutions that benefit everybody. This is a somewhat old uh, slide now. Resources for the Future conducted a study about 20 years ago showing attitudes in the US and China and in Sweden towards things like, is climate change occurring? Is it our fault? Should we do something about it? Are you willing to make sacrifices? In China and in Sweden, um, the number of, of the centers in China was 5%, Sweden 6%, 24% in the US. Don't have numbers for Canada. Um, is it humans' fault? 96% in China, 94% in Sweden think humans uh, have at least some responsibility. In the US, 73%. Well, that's more than half, but it's a, de a depressing number, et cetera, et cetera. Um, but Norms are dynamic. Paul Ehrlich and I wrote this paper in 2005, pointing this out. And what we were looking at was these sorts of data. We didn't have this in 2005. But in about 2007 and 2008, 
attitudes towards climate change had changed, and people thought, even in the U.S., that, that climate change was a real problem, we ought to do something about it. Then came the financial collapse, and people's priorities changed, and so you can see that between 2008 and 2010, in the U.S., and this is now a Yale University, George Mason University study, the number that were alarmed by climate change uh, went from 18% to 10%. Uh, the number that were dismissive went from 7% to 16%. Now it's 10 years later, and the numbers are back up pretty close to where they were before. So that indicates not just that attitudes and norms can change, but that exogenous events um, can, can affect it. Even I, being an ecologist concerned about these things, in 2008 thought, this is what's happening to my retirement. Maybe we better fix this first. I'll worry about climate change next year. <laughs> um, but these changes have taken place. This is the latest study from the um, George Mason Center for Climate Change Communication. And uh, the, you can see here the same numbers. This was in 2008. Uh, those who were sure that climate change, that global warming was happening, fell from 51% to 33%. And it's gradually made its way back up to about 49%, almost back to where it was before. So attitudes can change dramatically, but right now the news is good. The central issues are issues, therefore, I argue, of behavior and culture, and we have to understand those. We have, um, that relate to intergenerational and intragenerational equity, to public goods and common pool resources, to how do we cooperate in the commons, and to social norms and institutions, and I might add, to leadership. Um, a dramatic example of social norm change is foot binding in China, which was, um, I think, a horrible practice that was sustained as a social norm over centuries, essentially a millennium and then dramatically changed in a very short period of time, to a large extent due to internal factors. What is, what's going on here with all of these things? In terms of equity, we discount. We discount the future. This is a picture my wife took of me a <laughs> long ago. Um, one tends to work to, to figure, well, I'll start my diet tomorrow. Um, and the, that's called the discount rate, and the discount rate played a fundamental role in one of the most influential reports on climate change, Nick Stern's um, British report. Most of the debate, he, he concluded that we really had to do something about this. And most of the debate about whether to accept his numbers had to do with the choice of discount rate that he took. He took a low discount rate. You can have a whole separate discussion about what's the right discount rate. Nobody really knows. We also discount the interests of others. This hasn't happened yet. But can you imagine flying from New Jersey to Seattle or Vancouver where the person next to you is talking on a cell phone the whole time? Um, yeah. <laughs> so how do we incorporate uh, the discount rate uh, and our concern for others into our, the numbers? And my late uh, colleague, Kenneth Arrow, one of the greatest economists ever, uh, led a study that uh, we produced now 15 years ago called Are We Consuming Too Much? in which we try to account for natural capital uh, at a discount rate uh, in looking at different countries and their consumption patterns. How do we protect ourselves and others and future generations against the consequences of our overuse of resources? Well, one thing you could do is if you own a golf course, this one's called Mar-a-Lago, <laughs> somewhere in Florida. And this is a real projection from Climate Central uh, in Princeton of what it's going to look like. Uh, I don't remember how many years in the future it is. So one way to deal with this is you could build a big wall, a beautiful, a beautiful wall that would protect your golf course. Uh, but maybe you can't get the money to do that. Uh, and don't work for it yourself. So another thing you could do is you could buy insurance, uh, which is the first step towards cooperative solutions, right? Uh, we all go buy insurance, but there are some problems with insurance. Uh, and so uh, a couple of alternatives have been developed that we've started to explore, and the mathematics of it is really quite beautiful. 
So again, I'll just tell you what these things are. One of them's called index insurance. It goes by other names in, in, um, too in the literature. And this was worked with uh, George Pacheco and uh, um, and, and, and uh, Vitor Vasconcelos, who's a postdoc with me. The idea of index insurance is the same. Suppose you're a farmer and you have land you want to protect. Now, you get bad weather and your crops die, or they look like they're dying. First of all, you don't have any incentive to protect them. Uh, you may as well just collect the insurance. The insurance company has to send somebody out to make sure you're telling the truth, um, and then if there's a big delay. So index insurance gets around all of these problems. It says, I'm going to insure you against bad weather. We can look that up on the web, bad weather. It may be that you had bad weather and you didn't lose anything. Well, that's fine. You'll still collect. It may be that you didn't have bad weather and you lost. Well, that's too bad. But on the average, this ought to work out. So index and the insurance company, you, no longer, you now have an incentive to preserve your crop because you're going to get the insurance anyway. Um, the insurance company doesn't have to send anybody out to see if you were telling the truth. They can send you a check right away. So index insurance is one way around this if you have the potential to be able to average over good years and bad years. If you don't, you may get together with some others that have uncorrelated risks with you and build a consortium. In fact, the insurance company may actually give you a better rate if you can get a group together to do that. So we've investigated the dynamics of that. Um, I'll say a bit in, in a minute about cooperation and how it arises. It's a fundamental problem in evolutionary theory and pro-sociality and the development of social norms. Social norms, which I'll say more in just a moment, um, if they become well established enough to become laws and uh, religions have their own laws. The, the laws that religions have actually work very well. There's a law in Princeton or New Jersey, I guess, against driving, and probably here too, uh, talking on your cell phone while you're driving. But people do it all the time because it's not really enforced. And people can see that it's not enforced. You know, religions say if you don't do this, uh, there's going to be punishment later, but there's no way to check that, right? <laughs> <laughs> so those things actually work even better. <laughs> uh, and and uh, international agreements and how do they get established. Let me give you a couple of examples. Um, with Avinash Dixon and Dan Rubenstein, we looked at insurance arrangements, and this is all applications of game theory, among East African herdsmen. What is, how does this work? Well, they have good years, they have bad years. But suppose um, I'm having a bad year in terms of, oh, of the weather conditions. So I say to Rial, can I send my cattle over to graze on your land? And he says, why should I let you do that? I said, well, because next year it may be reversed, and you can send your cattle back to graze on my land. He said, okay, maybe that makes sense. He makes some computation, and a lot depends on the discount rate he's using, how much he cares about next year relative to this year. And he may come back to me and say, okay, or he may say, no, um, it all depends on the discount rate. So we looked at this problem by first, by writing a mathematical model, first asking, what would the social optimum be if we could get together? And then we could ask, is this a Nash equilibrium? Is this stable in a game theoretic sense? Is it self-enforcing? If it's not, we can then look for what are called second best solutions. So we all comes back to me and says, I don't want all your cattle, but you can send me 10. And I know that next year I can only send you 10. So that's not the optimal solution, but it's not as bad as everybody for themselves. But you could work all this out in the mathematics of it. Um, and uh, so that's an exciting new direction. Um, the challenge is to maintain the public good. And there's one other dimension at which he says, but I also remember that my son is your student, so maybe I better <laughs> do this. But in, in, in East Africa, what this what this means is that I, I remember that if my sister has married the fellow in the next town, and that, so I have some concern, some pro-sociality for what's going on there. Pro-sociality is important. Um, Avinash and I have written a paper in which we look not at what are the effects of pro-sociality, but how does pro-sociality pro means I care about somebody else's payoffs as well, incorporate that 
into my own payoff function. And we show that this can arise and be sustained endogenously. Uh, public goods problems are widespread in socioeconomic and ecological contexts. Uh, the classic example would be uh, here uh, uh, land that uh, fishermen, uh, water that fishermen and oil rigs are sharing. Uh, but I mentioned tumors as a breakdown of public good. Uh, and we've also been interested in the fact that tumors themselves depend on the production of cytokines by tumor cells that are crucial to the growth of the tumor. So if we could find ways to undercut the cytokine production, and this is work um, with George Pacheco and David Dingley, an oncologist, David has engineered cells that don't produce the cytokine. It's a game theory problem. If we could get them to spread, this could undercut the, the tumors and provide uh, a, a, an alternative treatment, possibly, for cancer. Um, the idea of the comments goes back, actually, to William Forster Lloyd. Um, two centuries ago, it was picked up by Garrett Hardin, who talked, who talked about the tragedy of the commons, how we don't have enough incentive even to get to this collective solution, and unless we can invoke what he called mutual coercion, mutually agreed upon. But for Garrett Hardin, he meant a large role for government. It was left to uh, Lynn Ostrom, Nobel laureate in economics, who sadly died a few years ago, to show that, that the maintenance of cooperation in smalls, fishing societies, etc., could arise endogenously by individuals getting into the sorts of agreements that Rial and I just uh, came to. Uh, some mechanisms, because it's much easier to do in small communities. Uh, and with former student and postdoc, Alessandro Tavoni and Maya Schluter, we looked at how fairness norms of this sort, and, and uh, the mechanism we used was ostracism, where those who, who engaged in more environmentally conscious behaviors, this was withdrawals from the fishery, could sustain a social norm and could at least get to a second best solution. We've done a lot of work on that since uh, with Andrew Tillman, who was a graduate student of mine. Um, Social norms can sustain and enhance pro-social behavior. Uh, some of the classic experimental work on this is due to Ernst Fair, and this stimulated a game that I play with my class every year, and it always works. You know, what Ernst Fair did is he took a room like this, he gives everybody a certain set of resources. He said, you can either spend the resource on yourself, or you can put it in a public a uh, pool that will be later shared by everybody. Or you can use it to punish other individuals. It costs you to punish, but it might make you feel good uh, to punish. And so um, I give individuals the choice, and there's some that adapt all these strategies. Fair plays this game over and over again. Everybody knows who's been generous and who hasn't. And over time, uh, individuals punish those who have been selfish, that leads them to be more likely to contribute to the public good, and over time cooperation evolves and punishment co-evolves with it. So this shows you that humans will punish others who deviate from social norms, even at cost to themselves. The classic example is the ultimatum game. Uh, in, the, in the ultimatum game, um, I choose someone, Shadi sitting here, and I say, I'll give you $100,000, but you have to share it with somebody in the back there, somebody you don't know. You choose how to share it, and they decide whether to accept it uh, or not. There's no negotiation. You don't get to, to play this multiple times. Everybody knows the rules of the game. So when I played this in class, I gave a student $100,000. Well, I didn't do it. $100,000. And I said, how much will you give her in the back? And he said $30,000. I said, will you take it? She said, no, I reject it. I said, it's going to cost you $30,000. She said, yeah, it's going to cost him $70,000. And so you play these games in different societies. Joe Henrik at the University of Washington has done different studies of this, and different norms have evolved in different societies as to what's the right amount to share. Individual, now, most of us would not turn down $30,000, but if you got offered $3, I'll bet you'd turn it down just for the pleasure of costing 
And I brought another person $99,997. Um, so everybody's got their price, and, uh, and the question is how much are you willing to spend to punish people who, who deviate from the social norm? Punishment itself becomes a norm, can evolve from repeated interaction. Norms are important to understand much about pro-social behavior in our societies and how we're going to get the solution. And ultimately, they become formalized into rules and into laws. Um, there is hope. I'm going to conclude on a hopeful note. Uh, maybe some of you saw several months ago that Norway's trillion dollar pension fund, this is Norges Bank, the Norwegian bank, is going to shift their investments from uh, oil and gas investments into alternatives. Just two weeks ago, I helped to run a meeting at Norges Bank in New York. Um, and um, where they were, we're brought together people from a, a lot of companies, insurance companies and the like, who were interested in, who were worried about climate change. Companies are worried about climate change. One of the things, as I proposed things to the Norges Bank people, it became clear that their interest in this, and this is fine, was purely selfish. They didn't think that their investments in oil and gas were sustainable. And so they wanted to know, what are the climate risks of this, and how should we be shifting? But they've already started shifting their investment. Mark Carney, a governor of the Bank of England, wrote that once climate change becomes a clear and present danger to financial stability, uh, it may be too late to stabilize and to the disintegrate. So we better do something now is basically what, what he's saying here. Um, so my experience, and I've taken part in, in three or four meetings over the last, since February, um, large companies, hedge funds, insurance companies in particular, anybody who's got an investment in coal uh, companies can't, can't doesn't have an alternative. But if you're an insurance company, you can average over the industry, and there's a lot of concern about the next 10 to 20 years. They're all changing their behavior, not as fast enough break, perhaps, in their own self-interest. Um, I consult for the Boston Consulting Group, which has gotten very interested in this and advising companies about how to become <coughs> sustainable. Uh, Decarbonization is a central theme. There's something called the UN Compact that Gerard Kell has led. I took part, there's a regular Venice forum of people largely from companies that are worrying about this and other fora leading to collective action. Lynn Ostrom, in, one of, in the last set of papers she wrote, talked about approaches to climate change, the necessity to build on her approaches, what she called polycentric approaches, you can't get 200 nations to agree, but maybe you can get smaller agreements that become building blocks. <clears throat> mutual coercion, mutually agreed upon at the local scale, which then can be scaled up. And it's related to what Bill Nordhaus, one of the most recent Nobel laureates, talked about with his climate clubs. With Andrew Tillman, who is the postdoc now at Penn, just got his degree two years ago with me, and Avinash Dixon, a great economist, whom I've already mentioned, we've been looking at how this might work by dividing the population up uh, into, into local beings in which individuals care much more about each other and develop cooperative arrangements. How, how does this scale up to a meta-population of individual uh, populations that interact with each other? <clears throat> and with um, George Pacheco and Vitor Vasconcelos, whom I've already mentioned, and Phil Hannum, we've just published one paper, we've got another one in review, on how one can develop climate change. And one of the things that's crucial uh, in this is that individual nations do not belong, it, it's not a hierarchical assemblage. And what's crucial is that, for example, Canada will uh, belong to a number of different uh, international agreements on different issues. Uh, so these are overlapping uh, arrangements. And, and that becomes very important uh, in terms of, of, of getting ultimate agreements. So in summary, modeling of collective decision making, I think, represents a really exciting new frontier in theoretical ecology. How do ideas get propagated? How do social norms get established like foot binding and spread? We've seen changes in lots of things like attitudes 
not fast enough, but attitudes towards gender equality, attitudes towards racial equality, cigarette smoking in public, um, flying the Confederate flag in South Carolina, um, and some of the data I showed you before in which attitudes and opinions and actions change on dramatic timescales influenced by what others do. How do we get collective actions? These all involve applications of game theory as well as the more classical methods. Attitudinal shifts I showed you can happen rapidly. They affect action on issues like climate change. In human societies, just like in other animal groups, there may be really very few leaders and people depend upon asking around what do others do. People don't make decisions for themselves. And that leads to sudden shifts in attitudes that's given momentum by the large number of people who are basically followers. We need to take this into account in uh, achieving environmental actions. So in conclusion, ecological systems and socioeconomic systems alike are complex adaptive systems. And the challenges there for mathematics largely are to develop the statistical mechanics of these ecological communities and the socioeconomic systems um, that they're associated with. How do they couple the human systems? Modeling the emergence of pattern on multiple scales. Uh, develop indicators of impending critical transitions. Uh, those are the things I talked about at the beginning. And finally, finding pathways to governance in this multi-scale commons. My friend uh, Bob Austin sent me this slide in the lecture he did from Dina Stumian, who said, I'd like to thank the National Institutes of Health for supporting my work, but they didn't, so I won't. Uh, he said, and a review I got from the NIH said, the work described is focusing on an important system. It's very interesting. It seems, however, the author proposes to do mostly thinking. It's not clear the NIH should support thinking. <laughs> well, I'm going to argue that we need to do more thinking, that uh, theoretical ecology is a rich history, demography, and behavior all of those applied areas, um, and the, uh, um, that, that I've talked about. But moving forward, we need to address new challenges. A number of us organized what's called a Sackler Symposium. Um, I don't know how much longer those are going to last. This is, uh, part of the Sackler family is, um, is, is getting a lot of bad press. I don't want to go into that. But we, we published a, uh, it, it wasn't the people who funded this. Um, this series of symposium that the National Academy runs. So we published an issue that's just come out called Economics, Environment, and Sustainable Development, in which we identify a lot of the challenges at the interface uh, between ecology and environment on the one hand and economics. Uh, it deals with issues like how do you, how do you take into account ethics and equity? Uh, how do you take into account the, the dynamics of societies and the potential for attitudinal shifts? pro-sociality and problems of the economics. <coughs> These are old challenges, but they have a new dimension to them. Uh, Galileo said that the universe is written in the language of mathematics. Uh, and I, so I think we have reason to continue to anticipate and enjoy uh, what Victor called the unreasonable effectiveness of mathematics in the natural sciences. So with that, I'll stop. Thank you very much. <laughs>